Welcome to the On Pace podcast. Today we are here talking with Jen Goldbeck, an ultra marathon runner who resides in Washington, D.C. She is a computer scientist as well as a professor at the University of Maryland. A uh, companion to her squad of five famous golden retrievers from the Instagram page, The Golden Ratio 4. How are you doing today? Hey, good. How are you? I'm great. Thanks for doing this. I really oh, I'm appreciate really it. I'm really excited. Awesome. So let's just get right into it. Why, why'd you start running? Uh, you know, so I like ran a little bit like in middle school, um, but, you know, sort of stopped after that. Um <laughs> But in 1999, I like went out my front door. I was in graduate school and the Chicago Marathon was like literally running on the street past my apartment. And I was so inspired. I was like, next year, I'm totally going to do that. I mean, I hadn't run a mile in, you know, 10 years, maybe. Yeah. Uh, and so like the next day, like went and got myself a pair of running shoes and started training. And it was not the best race I've ever had, but I finished it. Um, and, uh, and you know, that, that really got me into it. And, uh, you know, it was sort of up and down for a while till I finished grad school, but, uh, that, that got me into the long distances, which was really fun. Yeah. That's awesome. So how long have you been running for now? And like, yes, um, 20 years, no, 20 years now. Is it, God, is it that long? Oh, now I feel so old. <laughs> yeah. Since 1999, I guess. Um, you know, more and, and less sometimes, but I, you know, after I did that, I took some time off for marathons after that, but I was doing a lot of half marathons and stuff, uh, while I finished graduate school. And then, um, it's probably been, you know, 12 or 13 years that I've been kind of consistently doing lots of marathons and then like moving into ultras. Yeah. How'd you, how did that happen? How did you move into ultras? <laughs> so my first ultra actually was not long after my first marathon. Uh, so I ran the, it, yeah, it was quite a thing. So I, I ran the 2000 Chicago marathon, which is in October. Um, and I finished, but like I, I was under trained, I was really burned out at the end of it. And so I didn't run again for like six months. Like I finished that marathon and like, that was it. I didn't run all winter. <laughs> and, uh, in like April I was like, all right, like it's time to start running again. It was starting to get nice out. So I was looking through like the online list of races for like a 5k to run that weekend. And I saw on there, there's a 50k, which is like an insane number, right? If you're looking for a 5k, like this doesn't <laughs> make sense. And I turned to my boyfriend at the time and I was like, Hey, there's this 50k. Like that's what I should run totally as a joke. And he's like, you couldn't do a 50k. And I was like, well, <laughs> okay. So I signed up for it. I mean, I hadn't, I hadn't run for six months. I'll show um, you. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I'm like, this is stupid, but I can do whatever stupid thing I want to do. Um, so yeah, I, I did it. So I ran about the first 10 miles. I walked the last 20 miles. I think I cried for pretty much most of the end of it. Uh, it took me almost eight hours on like a perfectly flat course. Um, but I finished it, right? So I proved to him that I could do it. That was terrible. Um, so I don't really count that. Um, but, you know, I had you know, I'd done a bunch of halves and then started doing more and more fulls where I was doing kind of a full marathon every month. And, and after doing like a year and a half of that, I was like, all right, you know, time to try some more distance and see if it's as bad as I remember. Um, and the 50 Ks were much easier, it turns out with some training and like consistent miles. And so, um, you know, 50 Ks and then, you know, onto 50 milers and I've done a hundred K and my first hundred miler, if all goes well, will be the keys 100, which is, I think, a month away, a little less a than month a month away. away. Yeah. Uh, so you're in full swing preparation mode still? I am in like the heart of the hard stuff. I ran, you know, all weekend last weekend. And then uh, I'm doing a 50 miler on Tuesday this week, just because the timing works out for that. Uh, it's um, a perfect lead up race. Yeah. Yeah. So, uh, and then, uh, then I'm going into taper. So one, one more hard week and then it eases up. So what do you do for your hard uh, training to get ready for that? Uh, I eat a lot, which is easy for me. <laughs> um, I really love my carbs. And so, uh, so I do a lot of that. Um, and I've started just like in the last month or two doing Pilates because, you know, I think everyone who does ultras discovers these weird <clears throat> muscle imbalances and things that hurt. Um, yeah, and for me, huge part, yeah. 
for sure. And, you know, I've been to PT for random stuff and they'd always been like, you know, you got to work on the core. It, you know, it's not bad, but it isn't as strong as it was. And I would have issues like around my hips and different parts. And so kind of on a whim said, well, try Pilates. And uh, it's been great. I mean, even after a week, I could really tell a difference in my running and, and stuff that would hurt on my long runs was not hurting as bad. And so that I've started doing pretty much every day and has been like this great introduction. Um, and so like, even when I'm doing like timed runs, right? Like, so last weekend I did six hours one day and four hours the next day, I'll like run an hour to my Pilates studio and then I'll do a class and then I'll go run another five hours after that. Yeah, so just mix it in. You feel um, fresh after that, eh? Yeah. I mean, it, the stretching is great and the core work is amazing. So, uh, so it doesn't, it's such a different workout than the running that I feel like I can really just mix them together. And, uh, and that's been great. Uh, really. I find that with yoga a lot. I mean, after I do like a yoga class, you can go out and just have a nice pain-free run and yeah, not working against your own body the whole time. Right. Right. It's, it's really fantastic. So, so your training is Pilates and lots of hours of running. <laughs> that, that's it. Um, and when lots I'm, of carbs. <laughs> <laughs> lots of carbs. Yeah, yeah. Um, when I'm not like deep in the training like this, I'll sometimes cross train like cycling. I used to do triathlons, but running is really what I like. So that's that's what I like to spend most of my time doing. So how do you find time for that with the uh, well, the two jobs that well, I mentioned before? <laughs> yeah. How do you fit um, that in? Uh, I use it for like uh, commuting, for example. So I don't, I don't run to commute oh, okay. to work, but like when my husband and I'll go out on a date for dinner, he, there's two ways to get to his office from our house and it's either eight and a half miles or 13 miles. Yeah. And so, you know, in traffic in DC, that'll take me an hour to drive. And so I'll run instead, which, you know, takes longer, but basically that hour that I would be driving, I kind of, that becomes running time. And so my two hour run is really like an hour run and then an hour of time that I would be driving. So I fit it in a lot like that. This, um, is, uh, this is becoming a focal point on this show of people managing their time perfectly by using running to get somewhere. Yeah, yeah. Um, and, you know, it's so relaxing and uh, it's been I mean, it gets pretty warm here in D.C., but it's been cool enough where like I'm not a big sweater anyway. And so I can just kind of do like quick rinse off and change and go out to dinner and that works. <laughs> that works um, I'm yeah. also, I'm really lucky. Like a, my main job is being a professor, uh, which is like a great job and it's a lot of work, but it's super flexible. So I can do a lot of my hours, you know, late at night, early in the morning, whatever I want. And so, um, sometimes I'll just take kind of the middle of the day. If I have to run for three hours, I'll run from, you know, 11, start at 11 in the morning and it's fine. And then I can, you know, work later if I want to. So that, that gives me such a benefit that I think, you know, a lot of people who have a more kind of normal fixed schedule, it's harder, I think. So you do a lot of running with your dogs, I've seen. I do. Yeah. yeah. Uh, I have five dogs, five golden retrievers. They're kind of laying around. I've got one guy back there on the couch hanging out. <laughs> um, but yeah, they, uh, so they need their exercise too. And so one of my favorite kind of mid-length runs is to take, I have one that I run with a lot. So she can do up to five miles, but I'll usually do like three or four with her. Yeah. And then everybody goes out for what they can do. So uh, I can get about 10 miles that way. Uh, yeah. And then, you know, they get entertained, they get their time outside and, uh, and it's great. Like I get my running done. So, and it, it makes it so much more fun, right? Cause they're super excited. Uh, some of them are faster than others. So I get kind of variations in, <laughs> in there. That's so, so nice. Oh, that's great. So what's uh what's a standout event that you've competed in so far? What's something that you look back on and it really brings back like good memories? Yeah, I so I gotta say like uh, my first my first real fifty miler, um, I it, it didn't go all that great for just like weird reasons. But I still had this runner's high for like a week afterwards, which I think <laughs> is what made me go like, oh, I like these really long races. Um, but my first hundred k, which I did like uh, back September last year. Um, it was a looped course, like two and a half mile loop, which is exactly what I like. Um, I know lots of people like, you know, these big scenic long things. I love a looped course where I like see all the terrain. I know exactly what's coming. 
uh, was this was the Wildcat 100 in Florida, really well organized. It was crazy. I mean, I think the heat index was like 114 degrees at some point, wow. and uh, it was, and then it rained for four hours, and so you're just like running in the water, right? Like because it's like so much standing water there. I lost seven toenails in that race, uh, but I. I loved it. Um, I mean, yeah, I would rather not have had that happen to my toes. <laughs> um, it it was, you know, it pushed into that pain space that we deal with in really long ultras in a way that I hadn't dealt with before, and that I found really empowering. You know, it like it was some real suffering, um, but I felt like I had really accomplished a thing, kind of mentally after that race that I didn't know I could. It was, it's also the longest I've ever been able to run before. I, I ran pretty much the entire race. I only had to walk a bit at the end when my feet were so screwed up, uh, which I didn't know that I'd be able to do. I was like, maybe I can run like 35 miles and then I'll walk the rest. And I ran almost all of it. So it, it really signaled for me this transition into this whole other space of ultra running, uh, which I'm, you know, really proud of and kind of gave me, it made me think like, oh, I can do that hundred miler that I never thought would be within my set of abilities. So I I love that race. I'm going to go back and do it again this year. So when you're out there, how, how do you deal with the, the highs or lows? Like what's, what's something special that you do in your own mind to get you through it? When it, when it gets real bad and, you know, when I feel like I'm hitting the wall, um, i like podcasts will pull me out of that. So I I really feel like I need to distract myself from it. Um, I can go a long time just like letting my brain do its thing. But when I'm like, oh, I feel terrible. Everything sucks. Um, I really like true crime podcasts. And so I'll listen to, you know, murder stories and mysteries and um, anything, you know, and I'll I'll sometimes do audio books when I'm running, but like super plot driven stuff, like really things that like take me out of whatever I'm thinking about and I'm really tied into that story that helps me so much. And so, uh, I make sure that I'm allowed to wear headphones in all the races that I've <laughs> some don't allow it. Uh, but I know that like, I need that when I hit those really, you know, deep, dark moments, like a thing to just take me out of my head. Uh, that really helps. Yeah, that's cool. And what, uh, what event stands out as the worst so far that, Oh, yeah. I mean, that first 50K that I did fight yeah, so. is probably the worst <laughs> one. Um, but sort of the second one that I did, you know, once I had been running for a long time, um, was a trail race. And so it was here in Maryland, um, you know, lots of hills and lots of like rocks and roots. And that's not my favorite terrain to run on. And I, I just even didn't even think about it. So I wasn't prepared for it when I got to the race. Uh, so I thought the the race was well organized and I was like pleased with how I did in it, but I was just super frustrated, like at myself in the course. And I hate that feeling where I'm like, I just want to be done with this. Like I hate this. <laughs> so, uh, you know, it wasn't bad like that first one. <clears throat> um, I at least learned the lesson that like, I don't want kind of technical trails unless I've, I'm really seeking it out. And so that helps me pick what races I'm going to do. Okay. And the, well, with such like a busy life schedule, what benefits do you feel running brings to it, brings to your life? Yeah, it, you know, so much of what I do as a professor is like thinking, right? Like I have to think really hard and focus intellectually on, on my work, it, kind of in all aspects of it. Um, it's great to just be able to go out there and like put my brain in neutral when I'm running, which is what I do most of the time. And sometimes it just like, thinks the same stupid thoughts over and over and that's fine right just gets it out of there um sometimes like when if I go long enough and I start to be able to focus again like I do come up with you know interesting stuff to think about for work but just like that ability to disengage from this like really intellectual life and focus on like this really physical space like that is great for me to have those two things to balance each other out because you can I mean I think all of us in our jobs can really end up where we could just sit in one place all day uh, in front of a computer and that could be our whole life, right? You don't have anything physical. And, uh, you know, I, I know I fell into that trap at points, especially when I was in grad school. So like having this kind of goal driven running stuff, even though I'm a very slow runner, I'm not going to win any races, but like having these distance goals, like that's great. It's just such a nice balance in my life, but I think I need it for my sanity. Oh, that's good. Yeah. That's uh. (laughs) I think that's like most runners it's 
helps you balance out your emotions and yeah it brings like that extra stress relief that antidepressant in it i've just... told people that right like a uh, running is supposed to be a stress relief and now i'm you know running 70 miles a week so what does that say about my stress <laughs> <laughs> there's a lot to deal with i guess <laughs> so uh Shoot, I got a little stuck there for a second. Okay. What personal achievements do you have that you've brought from running? Like, uh, what what places have you came in some of the races? What's the farthest distance you've gone? Yeah, uh, so my 100K is the furthest, but hopefully next month it'll be 100. 100. I, everything's going good so far. Like, I don't have any injuries. All the training has gone well. So I'm, you know, I'm nervous about it still, but I'm feeling pretty confident. Um, I have... It's interesting, like I, I said, I'm a slow runner and like I really am like I'm, you know, in the marathons, I'm not, you know, pushing cutoffs, but I'm definitely like in the back third. Um, but I have placed in some of these smaller races that I've done. And when I did the 100K in September, they're like, you're in second place among the women. And I was like, well, what are there two women? Like, no, <laughs> more, than, more than two. Uh, so that was good. And uh, I did a 50 miler last October and I came in third. And it's like, if you look at the results, it looks like it's out of three, but that's because like, like most of the field, it was a super hot day. Like they dropped down to the 50 K. So like 10 of the 50 milers dropped down. So I actually beat a whole bunch of people just because like awesome. I could kind of tough it out. <laughs> yeah. So I was like really proud of that. I got like a little finisher's prize and everything, which is like nothing I ever would have thought like a slow runner like me would get. Um, so, yeah, I'm not going to be like qualifying for Western states or anything like that. But uh, if I stick to these sort of local races that like I can handle, um, I do respectably. And that is great for me. Yeah, that's great. So I guess the heat training really helps out during those races. It does. Uh, you know, I love it. So we live, you know, here in Washington, D.C. most of the time. But we have uh, a house down in the Florida Keys. Um, where we live probably four or five months out of the year. And so we were just down there. It was, you know, I think the heat index was 107 on Friday. We had a really hot day. Uh, it was great training for this stuff. So I feel oh, like... I love the heat training. Oh, yeah. I, I love it. It's my favorite. And I feel like that, like I'm not great at hills, right? Like I don't want to be a mountain runner. Um, but I feel like heat is probably my strength. So my like long-term vision of a race I would love to do is bad water, uh, which I know would be miserable, but I'd love to do it. And I feel like, the, you know, it's on roads, it's flat, like I'm good at all of that. And then the heat, it would take some work to get used to that heat, um, to be able to run in that. But I, I feel like that's a thing that I can do, right? It would just be more of a thing I know how to do. Uh, yeah. So let's explain bad water a little bit to <laughs> somebody who might not know what it is. I'll let you take it away. Yeah. Uh, there, you can watch a great documentary about it on I'm YouTube. Running on it's the sun. Such a good, like, that's, I think, the thing that really made, inspired me to go try these longer ultras. And I think most people, it makes them go like, no, I am never going to try that. <laughs> um, so it's 135 mile, or 135 miles, uh, right? Or 135 miles. It starts in Badwater Basin uh, in Death Valley in California, the lowest point in the U.S., um, and it runs through Death Valley up to Mount Whitney. And I think originally it, it went to the summit of Mount Whitney, which was the highest point in the U.S. And now you can't go quite all the way to the top. So, um, but you stop there. So you run like 70 or 80 miles on this flat paved road through Death Valley. It's like 130 degrees. Uh, <laughs> people's shoes melt from being on the pavement. Um, and then you basically go up for the last 50 miles of the race. Uh, so you get a little bit of altitude in there. It, it's not like super steep peaks, you know, like some of these, you know, mountain races. It's just a slow, gradual uphill forever. And uh, yeah, it just doesn't end. Yeah. Yeah. It looks really intense. And, and obviously, like the biggest part of that is being able to handle the heat. So people do all kinds of crazy stuff to heat train them. But the, that, the movie that you mentioned, they have a guy in there who lives in Miami and he's like, the heat's fine. Like I train in this all the time in Miami. <laughs> so that made me go like, oh, I can run fine in Miami. So maybe, you know, if I ever get into that race, you know, once I feel comfortable at the hundred mile distance, um, that's on my eventual list. I'd love to do that. That's a big thing, being able to train in the heat, heat or cold. If you can withstand either one extreme, you can uh, outlast a lot of people in those races. 
for sure. Yeah. I, do all, I used to do all my running in Bangkok, Thailand when it oh was like 40 degrees with, and I'd go out run in the sun just because I wanted that extra little bit of, <laughs> and totally. just during the races there, you people would drop out from the heat and I'd be fine. Yeah. I think this is like a great skill. And, and I have, like, I'm not like that with the cold. I'm, I can't do it in the cold, but I have that same kind of admiration for people who go run, you know, these Arctic races, or there's like, there's an ultra that runs on the Iditarod course in Alaska, like the dog sledding race, which it's yeah, not for me. No, <laughs> I'm like, that's so cool. But like, there's no way like I want this as minimal number of cl clothes and like as many degrees as possible. <laughs> Yeah, I'll just watch that from TV. That's yeah. more, that's fine for me. <laughs> <laughs> so that's one of your dream races to come up. That was going to be my next question. Oh yeah, the bad water. I think so. Um, there's, you know, people ask me like when you see the Barkley marathons. You know, so many people have seen that documentary, um, this crazy race in Tennessee that nobody finishes most of the time. And people ask me like, oh, do you, you know, would you ever do that? And like, one, I would never get in. I would never make the cutoffs. But I have no interest in doing this like orienteering race, like Western states. Uh, you know, I mean, sure, if they like let me in, I'd totally run it. But it's not like a dream race for me. Um, Badwater is definitely up there. And at some point I might want to try like one of the staged ultras where you do kind of like 25 or 30 miles a day for like five days. Um, there's a bunch of those and that might be a cool, <clears throat> cool thing to do. But, um, you know, I've, I've sort of felt like I want to tackle that hundred mile distance to make sure I can do it. And I'm running the keys 100, which I'm super excited about. Like I live there part time. It's beautiful. And then after that, I'll see about picking out some races besides Badwater. But for now, like that's definitely top on my list as a dream race. Yeah, but Badwater is a pretty famous race. Yeah. It's on a lot of people's lists. For sure. Uh, ooh, that's just, I started thinking about Badwater. <laughs> <laughs> I really like the documentary on that. It's so, uh, so interesting. And you can just see so many people going through so much. The heat is just unbelievable. And it just, rip people apart and yeah. as you said people's shoes actually melt on the tarmac yeah just, um, uh... so there's a book out i think Corey reese is the author who wrote he's written a couple ultra running books um like nowhere near first was his first one like just about it and then i think and then he got into bad water eventually and ran it as sort of a you know back of the packer middle packer um, i think it's called into the furnace and it's great about all of his preparation and uh, you know, everything he went through in the race and he narrates the audio book. And so that's for people who want to learn more about it. Like that's another uh, really interesting kind of take from just like a regular ultra runner, not like a super elite on what it's like to do that really famous race. Yeah. yeah. So who has anybody inspired you to get into ultra running or does somebody inspire you from day to day? Um, you know, it was just me when I started, I didn't really know anybody else who had done them. <laughs> yeah. And, uh, uh, you know, I have a, like an old high school friend who I haven't seen since high school, and I knew her husband had done some ultras. And so I'd posted a couple of Facebook messages, and, and it turns out a couple other people I went to high school with had, do them and do 100 milers. And so I found like this little cabal of people I sort of know, and uh, they are great. Like they know exactly the right thing to say. So before my 100K, um, I was looking at the weather. I'm like, it's going to rain. This is going to be miserable. I, and I had messaged them. And I'm like, should I bail on this and wait for another race? And they're like, no, you know, this is going to be great. It's going to hurt anyway. Like, just get prepared. And they really helped get me in the right mindset to do that race. Um, and that's what you need, right? Because, like, other people go, what the hell are you doing, like, running that far? That and is the mindset you need, too. It's, no, it's going to be awesome. It's even going to be even worse, and it's going to be so much fun. <laughs> yeah. Um, it's, not, it's never, like, it's never too much. Yeah, and look, they were totally right. You know, like, it would have hurt even if it wasn't raining. And so just putting yourself in the mind, like, this is the thing I want to do, and it's going to be awesome, and whatever, you know, your blisters will heal. Um, so that, that's great. And then I love, you know, being able to see them do their races. So I don't, I don't have any, you know, you know, I love, I follow all these famous ultra runners on social media. Um, but there's no one where I'm like, Oh, that guy, I want to be that guy. I just love the people who are like really supportive and encouraging. You know, I, I tell great some community. people, yeah, like you can break the world. One of the many ways to break <laughs> the world into two people is like the people who go like, Oh, I do this thing, but you could never do that. 
and the people who go, I do this thing and you can totally do it if you want to. Uh, and I I'm going to show you how to do it. Let yeah. me help you. Here, you do this and this and this. If yeah. you ever have any questions, just ask. I'll be there for you. Totally. Yeah. And I think ultra running is a lot more like that. Because um, you don't get these super elite runners like you see like in marathons. I mean, there's some very elite ultra runners, but it's it's a really different world. And the elite ultra runners are not like elite marathon runners or half marathon runners. Uh, there's, um, there's not much crossover, is there? No, no. Ever it, see marathoners really doing that great in ultras and then yeah. you don't see it the other way around. Yeah. Um, and so, yeah, it just, it feels like much more of a community and much more, you know, it's really supportive. There are, you know, there are some hyper competitive people out there, but even, even they tend to be really supportive of the other people and helping them through it. And, and that's great. You know, uh, I don't need more competitiveness in my life. Like I got plenty of that. Uh, the support is great. And so that, that always like really helps me keep going to see that. And, you know, now in the, the groups that I'm on online to, to just see these people like cheering everyone through and helping them through. I love that. Well, they're all out there for the same reason, right? And you know how much it takes to get through one of those races. Yeah. So why why would you try to push anybody down? It's already hard enough. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> like you might you might need help another couple of miles down the road. So you you want to be as nice and as caring and help the people out as much as possible. Yeah, for sure. It's a community race, pretty much. Yeah. There's only like, as you said, a lot of the races you signed up to, you could probably count how many people are there, right? Yeah, that's right. And I mean, they're small. And, uh, you know, when I did my 100K, I was, I had to like fly out late. I was so like stressed getting out that I forgot my headlamp. So I didn't have a headlamp with me. <laughs> and I mean, we were running a lot of hours at night. And uh, it was a loop. So I kept going past the same people and past the wife of this guy who was doing a 100 miler who was crewing for him. And I was like, God, do you have a spare headlamp that I could use? And she just, she's like, oh, I got three extras. Like, here's one of those, change the batteries. And uh, and every time I came past, like, she offered me stuff and, you know, it was kind of like, I was there by myself and she was like kind of half crewing me, which you see all these races, right? Uh, I've People seen that on documentaries where like somebody will have like, not a big enough crew and they'll be like oh just take some more guys it's okay yeah. <laughs> you need it you need it just take it it's okay yeah and that's, uh, that's the community you're dealing with everybody wants each other to succeed they don't want to you know they don't want you to fail they know how it feels to fail when you're out there i'm pretty sure every ultra marathoner has a dnf in their record or sure. close to yeah <laughs> so they know yeah. what it's like yeah I, that's it's so nice. And that was like an unexpected thing uh, that I didn't know about when I got into this. And it has been like such a great discovery that it is, you know, that kind of supportive community of people. It's awesome. That'd be great. So what's it like to be a famous dog mom? <laughs> How did that happen? Uh, you know, I had two dogs and we fostered uh, golden retrievers with our local rescue group. And uh, dozens of them, you know, we had fostered and adopted out to new homes. And then we got this pair that came in together um, who'd been abandoned by their owners. And as soon as they got here, like they just fit in. And I was like, oh, now I have four dogs all of a sudden, <laughs> and which I never thought would happen. And so I made them an Instagram page and a Twitter account. And, uh, and everybody loved it. It's very pure, wonderful, happy content as a bunch of golden retrievers. And, yeah, no, I have a book. <laughs> yeah. And uh, eventually we got a fifth one. Uh, who's, a, who's 14 now. I mean, which is like a hundred years old for a golden retriever. Uh, so now we have five and, uh, <laughs> yeah, it's, it's the kind of thing where I just post really happy, encouraging, supportive messages and golden retrievers are goofy, wonderful dogs. And, uh, so wonderful. I love them. <laughs> it's, it's like an amazing life. Uh, a lot of vacuuming, but otherwise just like so much joy and love and everybody likes seeing that. So it, it really is the kind of thing that, grew itself and so it gives me this great outlet i started it because in 2016 after uh the presidential election here in the u.s and brexit in the uk like everything on social media was so terrible and angry oh my god it's still horrible it still <laughs> and so i was like we i need a corner that's absolutely no politics i mean i have opinions no politics nothing just like a happy thing 
that you can look at that's not any of that. That's why I started it. And it still gives me that little outlet. And I have a separate account. I don't follow anything political or angry in there. It's just the dogs. Everybody can love the dogs. And, uh, and I think that resonated with a lot of people who also wanted something as a contrast to like all the stuff we're all angry about all the time. Uh, so that the environment right now has kind of helped it along. I think that it's a, it's the antidote the world needs right now. To yeah, everything. That's one of the reasons why I started doing this is in the running community, you don't see any of that really negative stuff. There's a few people, of course, it's normal, but it's all just like happy, supportive people. And I was like, I want to talk to those people. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I want to see why they're so happy. I want to share why they're so happy. Yeah. And everybody, like almost every single runner has a like inspiring story to share. And it can touch somebody and maybe inspire them to get running and help change their life for the better. I, I think so. And I see that. So I have, it's interesting. I have a decent number of followers like on my account where I post about running pretty much all of them have come over because they follow the dogs and they're like, oh, you're the dog mom. I'll you. And a lot of them have started running too because they're like, well, if you're going to go run like 50 miles this weekend, I can go run two miles and get off my couch. And uh, and I love, you know, being able to be like, hey, no, you can totally do this. Even You know, you don't have to go run these crazy distances, like go run two miles or just, you know, get outside and walk around and it's great. Yeah, that's one thing that us runners, like I, Everybody that asks me how to start running, I don't tell them you go run like 70 kilometers this week. I say, <laughs> yeah. go run like three kilometers and see how you feel. Yeah. And then like, after they finish, they message me, I feel amazing. I feel so great. And I'm <laughs> like, yeah, that's why I'm always out running because I yeah. like the way it makes me feel. It makes me feel great and amazing. And yeah. I, can't, I can't get mad at anything. I just feel bliss. Yeah, that's exactly right. We We need more of that. We need more people doing that and more content about things that make us happy and blissful like that that's what we need yeah so uh, some inspiring words for other dog parents that might uh think they don't have the time to get out with their little friends and go for a little run yeah i mean uh you know test your dog out first like make sure like goldens are are good but they can't you know they can't run a hundred miles like, you know, an Alaskan Husky can't so figure out what your dog can handle, work them up to it. Just like a new runner, a little bit at a time, increase your mileage every week. Um, but they typically love it. And the thing is, you know, what I always tell people who are new runners is the same thing. I'll tell people who are new runners with dogs. Don't even bring a watch. Don't time yourself. It doesn't matter how fast you go. Just yes. like go slow, <laughs> get out there with your dog and a nice slow jog. And you're both going to have a good time and your dog will probably pull you along. That's great on an uphill. Let that dog pull on the uphill. Yeah. <laughs> it's um, going to tire them out too. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> you get your walks done faster because you're running. And so if you really feel crunched for time, like running it is going to make it take half as long as walking it. And uh, the dogs usually love it. And it's a way that, you know, it really helps you bond with your dogs. They love it. And way to, you know, take that time that you'd have to spend anyway, you know, getting the dog some exercise, getting yourself some too. So it's, it's great. And, you know, if you're both starting out, like do a couch to 5k with your dog. I've done yeah. that with my dogs, you know, when they just start them running and it totally works for both. And the great thing about dogs is it's basically a living alarm clock that forces you to get out <laughs> and go exercise. Because once they start, every time that time comes around each day, they're going to be, hey, what are you doing? Why are you sitting on the couch? It's time to go for a run. If I have a day where it's like, you know, it's cold and it's rainy and I'm tired and I'm stressed and I'm like, I don't know if I'm going to go. All I have to do is like, I'm just going to put on my running clothes. And so if it were just me, I wouldn't always get out on those days. But my main running partner dog knows. And then she sits there and she gives me like these dog puppy eyes. It's like, it's time, it's time. And I know that I can't resist that. So if it's ever like, I can't go, I just put on the clothes enough that she knows. And then she'll eventually get me out the door. <laughs> yeah, that's perfect. That sounds, that's just like the, there's no reason not to go for a run. If you got a sad dog looking at you. <laughs> that's right. <laughs> <laughs> uh, let's, uh, well, you got anything you want to tell people? I don't think so. No, uh, that's pretty much like perfect awesome a little bit of inspiration for the people that with dogs that want to get running you're yeah. a great example of that 
let people know where they can find you, your social media pages or anything. Yeah. Um, so the dogs are what you will all probably really be interested in. And they're the golden ratio for on like every platform, uh, the number four. And I am Jen runs with dogs is my handle on Twitter and Instagram. Um, so yeah, if you find the dogs, you'll find your way to me. Eventually. Yeah, pretty much. That was <laughs> awesome. I really that put a smile on my face. Thank you. <laughs> All right. I'm going to that's a great note to close the show on. Uh, we have been speaking on with Jen Goldbeck on the On Pace podcast. You can find this podcast at www.onpacepodcast.com. You can find us on Instagram, Facebook, and YouTube at On Pace Podcast and Twitter at Pace Podcast. Thanks so much for doing this. I really enjoyed it. I had so much fun. Thank you. Okay. Talk soon. See you. Bye. Welcome to the On Pace Podcast.